going to give looks like Nick needs one more minute to get in. And Sarah too, right? Perfect. Great, the time is now seven o'clock. So I would like to welcome everyone to the Scarborough Public Schools Bo Board of Education meeting for this evening. Today is Thursday, April 15th, 2021. Could I have the attendance, please? Sure. Mrs. Giftis? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Lashna? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Mr. Bennett? Here. And Ms. Giftis? Here. Here. Perfect. Everyone, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda item 4.0 is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments this evening? Seeing none. Uh, agenda item 5.0 is public comment on agenda items. Um, just go through the spiel um, one more time here every week. Um, I will ask that members of the public who wish to speak to agenda items, please raise your little blue hand. Um, if you click on your own name, you should be, have the option to raise hand. Um, each speaker will have three minutes and I will be using my phone to time you. Um, I will mute myself and when the timer goes off, I will unmute and you'll kind of get that um, blast of music and that lets you know that your time is up. So if you could please wrap up when you do hear the music, that's appreciated. Um, please direct your comments to me, the chair state name and your address for us when you begin. Um, we have five public comments that we received via email that Kelly Johnson will be reading for us. Um, I will go ahead and let Kelly start. Kelly, if you wanna do three, and then I will call on members of the um, public who are in attendance. Okay. Uh, this first email is from, and I apologize, Elise, Elise Char Charello, and she says, good evening. Ahead of tonight's meeting, I would like to submit a question and comment. With the announcement of New Hampshire being directed for five full days of in-person learning by April 19th, and Massachusetts doing the same, it is evident that our neighboring states agree that full, full days in-person is the best for our children academically and emotionally. When does the board plan on putting their agenda for return in the fall? Parents are very eagerly awaiting this information for planning purposes. Additionally, as the second dose of the vaccine is likely on the horizon for our educators, does the superintendent plan to reach out to the Department of Education or the governor's office requesting ways to work around the three-foot guidelines the way other neighboring districts like Bonnie Eagle have? It'd be very nice to see our school district fight for our children's education. Um, Scarborough resident, mother of three. Shut my phone off, sorry. This next email is from Allison Neeland of 19 Jamaco Mill Road. Dear school board, thank you for including fall school reopening on your agenda today. It is critical that we start immediately planning for a five day a week in-person school schedule. I hope that this conversation will be ongoing throughout all remaining school board meetings. 
I have read through most of Biddeford School District's 69 page comprehensive plan for reopening and am I impressed by their thoroughness. I look forward to seeing an equally detailed plan from Scarborough in the near future. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to use Biddeford's plan as a model. I'm also encouraged to hear that Cape Elizabeth and Falmouth have found creative solutions to opening this spring. If they can do it, so can Scarborough. As you consider the 21-22 calendar, I urge you not to fall into the trap of seeing student in school time and professional development for teachers as being mutually exclusive. We do not have to shorten school days for kids in order to provide robust opportunities for training and collaboration for teachers. I've had the unique opportunity of living and teaching around the world, and I've seen many successful schedules that allow teachers to have substantial planning and professional development time. Scott was the first place we've lived where the district asked kids and therefore families to sacrifice in order for teachers to have planning time. As a parent of three school-aged kids, I'm more than happy to be part of a working group to develop creative staffing and scheduling solutions so that our teachers can get the planning time they need and our students can get the in-person school time that they need. I request that the school board pressure school administrators to develop a better plan for transitioning kids into the new school year without asking our kids to give up even more of their in-person time. I do not support the plans to phase in instructional time at the beginning of the school, nor the plan to make Wednesday a shortened day. These plans put the burden entirely on families to bear the cost and responsibility of educating children during school hours. Instead, we need to keep kids in school and build a schedule so teachers can get the time they need to be effective in the classroom. This is hard but important work, and I know there are many parents like me who are eager to help develop a plan that serves the needs of our kids and their amazing teachers simultaneously. Sincerely, Allison Neeland. This third email is from Ethan and Sarah McGrain. Dear board members, we are continuing to advocate for the full return of in-person learning. We have three children in the Scarborough School District and all have been negatively impacted with this year's hybrid learning. We tack children in with tears in their eyes saying they are lonely, they miss their friends, they miss their teacher, they miss their routine. All the districts around us are finding ways to return children to school full-time this school year and have already outlined their plans to return children this school year and have already oh, sorry, outlined their plans for the fall. Please bring back our children full-time five days a week in the fall. Please do not push the stop, make, stop date back to make children miss even more school days. We have so much ground to make up with the loss of education they missed this year. Every day is precious. Thank you for your time, Ethan and Sarah. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I'm going to go to Mr. Bartlett first, and then Ms. Pine, you will be on deck. Oh, I'm actually not a host. I can't promote. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Hello? I can hear you, Brian. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, this is Brian Bartlett. I'm at 8 Redbrook Lane here in Scarborough. I have uh, two children in the Scarborough school system. Both of them are eight corners. I found it absolutely appalling at the lack of a consistent effort to get the kids back into school full-time in-person learning this school year. It has been incredibly and emotionally taxing for my children being out of the school as much as they have been over the past year plus at this point. Their education has been suffering as a byproduct of the lack of in-person learning. I appreciate all of you looking to get back into school full-time in-person learning next school year. However, our children are struggling now and they need to be back in school full-time now. I know you have all heard the parents at previous school board meetings about a month ago, with the parents pleading with you on behalf of their kids, and we were completely dismissed because it was difficult. With the new data that you have tonight, I ask that you not only find a way to go back full-time next year, but also this year. When it comes down to additional professional development time next year, we all know our kids have already missed too much in-person instruction and should not be, they shouldn't have to miss any more. I can understand needing one early release or late start day per month, but beyond that is ridiculous at this point, given how much they've already missed. It is time to get 
back to school full time. So as fast as possible. Um, time is of the essence here, guys. Come on. And it's time to do what's the best thing for all of the kids. Let's get back to school full time. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Della, you should be all set. Okay, good evening, chair and school board members. So after another week of successes of neighboring school districts, figuring out how to increase student classroom time to four or even five days a week, the frustration in me rises. To have my student denied the same opportunities offered around the state can only be described as inequitable, and it clearly does not put our students as a top priority. The school board has chosen to stay the course in hybrid with the intention of planning for a full-time return in the fall, but we have yet to see any plans. It does not seem unreasonable that we as the stakeholders should receive weekly updates with those plans and progress reports. As we look to the fall, I would ask that you remember your requirement to keep the students as the number one priority and concern. Students have spent enough time out of the classroom. Transition days for anyone other than perhaps incoming kindergartners are not needed. Students need full days, five days a week, starting as early as possible. An alternative to the proposed transition days at the start of the school year may be to reintroduce the August kinder camp with similar options for grades one and two as to not take away from classroom time at the start of the school year. If anything, we should be decreasing the summer, not increasing due to the education catch up needed. So please make choices and find options that give our students the benefits of classroom time a full five days a week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kelly, I'm gonna go back to you. Okay, uh, this next letter is from Winnie Lee. Dear Chair, thank you everyone for your passion for our children. We know it is a labor of love doing what you do for our children. You have shouldered two times, if not three times, the amount of workload and have done it so graciously. For us parents, I don't drop my kids off at school because school will fix all of the problems. I bring my kids to school knowing the integral role it will play in the daily life of my family. School is essential. It truly takes a village to raise our children. Most recently, with the implemented half-day Wednesdays, my girls came home so refreshed. They said, Mom, we didn't do our usual schoolwork, but instead we did a lot of fun activities. It filled my bucket because our educators wisely used this brief amount of time to address the SEL needs of our children. Time and time again, everyone has pulled off what is short of a miracle while managing all of the moving pieces behind the scenes. As much as we long for the good old days, I know that it won't be, nor should it remain the same. Our children in their schools have been changed forever. As the landscape of education has evolved, fresh ideas for educating our children can be nurtured. We have seen how relationships and socialization is so integral to learning. I know firsthand how starved of human interaction my children were during this pandemic. Any opportunity for peer interaction did oneness for them. Here we have a big opportunity to think big. We have ESSA grant money and additional federal funding in the pipeline. 20% of this money is earmarked to address learning, loss, and social emotional needs with the remainder dedicated to reopening our schools full time. The wait and see approach is no longer applicable as we know we can safely reopen schools. We are now in the minority list of schools that are offering less than four days a week. I expect that we are not aggressively, I expect that we not only aggressively plan towards reopening schools with urgency, but do so strategically beginning with task force selection that is optimistic and solution oriented towards this goal. In the process, we need transparency as it builds trust and confidence. Without transparency, there's no accountability. This situation demands exceptional leadership and creativity. Thank you, Winnie Lee. This next letter is from Rachel Discall. Discall. Dear Superintendent and School Board Committee, I'd like to address the reopening plan for Scarborough Schools for the 21-22 school year. We are over a year into this pandemic and we've seen the absolute devastating consequences for our children not being in school full time. The mental health consequences have been nearly catastrophic. 
The current COVID response by the school district has led to social isolation and has caused our children to have suicidal ideation, increased substance abuse, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and the list goes on. The student dropout rate has increased. Our children have had decreased learning, decreased math scores. We're destroying our children. I urge you to please use the next data that we have learned over the last year to resume normal activities and schedules that support our children with education, health, social emotional well-being, and psychological stability. Please look at states that have had their children in full time and other surrounding main towns to support a safe plan for Scarborough. Our children deserve more. They continue to remain a low risk group, have had low hospitalizations, and there have been no child deaths to Maine children, to children in the state of Maine to date. Regards, Rachel Disco. Thank you, Kelly. I believe that's the last one I have. Okay, thank you. I think so too. Um, Mr. Fertold, I'm going to promote you, and then Mrs. Ladd, you will be next. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. All right. First off, thank you all to the school council. I know you've had quite the interesting year. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of getting in to everything now. Um, and I'd, I'd resign myself to the fact that we were going to have the hybrid model for the remainder of this year. I, I would love to see us go full time. I don't know if we have the plans and the organization right now in place for that. But again, I, I, I am endorsing that. I do have some, I guess my biggest fear would be in the fall going back to the same situation. From what I can gather based on what we have for vaccines and now the reduced space requirement of three feet, uh, I, it seems as though is that three foot limiting factor is all I can really put my finger on that would prevent us from going full, you know, back to normal, I guess, quote unquote, the five days. Um, and I just hope that we're putting all our resources and thoughts and plans into thinking inside, outside the box, or making new boxes or whatever we can do. Uh, following Biddeford's lead, where they're using outside resources, uh, I have friends in Massachusetts that are all going back to have already started going back um, five days a week. So I, I'm just I feel quite sure that if they can do it, uh, we can find a way to get that three. I, Again, I assume the only thing that's holding us back is the three-foot space, which I understand is a difficult issue. I just hope that's really the forefront of getting this going. Um, so again, I'm looking hopefully for full five days as soon as possible that we logically can, and I hope we're looking at all resources we can to, to allow for that. Um, I'm glad to hear that some people were really appreciative of that half-day Wednesday. Um, for, you know, it. I know for some people with childcare who have organized and kind of run around to get as much childcare as they can, I know for some it ended up, for some people it was more of a hassle than it was an actual benefit. Um, with all the surveys that were happening, I, I, I kind of, I was surprised that that wasn't surveyed before it came. I don't think it was. I, I didn't notice that survey before it came through. Um, you know, having one extra day a month for, you know, it just seemed to some extent it seemed more, costly and difficult than it was as a benefit. But again, hearing people speak to the benefits of that, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, and my last thought is just knowing that even in this current environment, the days where the kids aren't in school, they're going to daycares, they're having play dates, they're rolling around outside and playing. It's happening. It might not be happening under the, you know, the watchful eye of the school, but it is happening. So I feel almost in a sense that right now the kids are more at risk joining daycares, getting together, having, fun, you know, being kids, which I, I love to see. And they're not, they're not really having widespread reactions to anything. There, it's not, there's no clusters as far as I can tell, and especially the younger groups. My child's at eight corners. Sorry, I live in 45 Maple Ave is the introduction. Um, so these kids are gathering in, in groups on the days they don't have school. It's, it's more or less a free for all. People are finding any daycare they can because people are working for the beginning of the, the school year. A lot of these daycares weren't even wearing masks and there were no outbreaks. Now they've all gone to full masks and they've had, they've had great luck with that. So I hope that can go into the equation 
again, I, I know the main thing of the equation is that I think that three foot requirement, but I just hope this other peripheral information helps us to understand that we should be trying to push or hope to make, you know, facilitate this as best as possible. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you should be all set. And Jen, if you want to unmute, you should be all set. Great. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for um, hearing all of these comments again. Um, in March, I spoke at a meeting and listed a handful of districts who were already opening more fully, hopefully as positive examples and really hoping that our district could, could join them. Um, but now here we are really at the back of the pack, one of a shrinking list of districts left with less than four days in person and in school. Our staff have done such a tremendous job implementing the half day Wednesdays that were approved at a prior meeting um, and the kids are loving it. I haven't heard from a single child or parent who doesn't say that they're, this has just like been a light in their, in their kids, um, you know, in their life recently. And so I just really ask with the utmost sincerity that you please empower some of the same staff and the forthcoming building committees to go the rest of the way by voting tonight to let them open their classrooms to the fullest extent that they are able as soon as possible without having to wait for another meeting. I look forward to hearing the details of the rest of the fall plan tonight because I know that there's been a lot of work going on there. Um, but if there are plans for a full in-person return in the fall that assume no change to the current CDC guidelines, it's really hard for me to then imagine how that same plan could not be implemented sooner. And I understand that that might be different at different levels of our, of our schools. Um, but our kids honestly deserve that kind of effort after the efforts that they've put in this year, because it's been really hard for them too. And I believe that you as school board members, that you honestly have the best interests of our kids in your hearts. It's literally your mission as our board members. Anyone that doesn't should simply no longer serve on this board. I also believe that you know that in-person instruction is what's best for our kids. And I believe with those two facts as your guide and the continued hard work and staff that support all of the really good things that are happening in this district, that you will go ahead and make the right choices for our kids, not only for next year, but for the rest of this year too. Thanks. Thank you very much. Jeremy Dill, I'm gonna promote you. Here we Jeremy. go. Yep, can you hear me? You we can hear you. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeremy Dill. I'm the father of a first grader at Blue Point School. So I will say that this hybrid learning model is very much uh, most of what she's known for her educational experience. And like a lot of the parents, you know, I certainly echo this desire for them to return full time in the fall. Um, I, I know the challenges that uh, returning earlier may present, but I think certainly uh, looking ahead to the fall, I'm hopeful that that the opportunity will arise and this will be fulfilled. But I, I guess I also realize that, you know, my complaints and my concerns are also coming from a, a place of privilege and that I think we also got to look at things through a lens of equity. Um, you know, looking at recent statistics about the Scarborough School District almost 8% of students in Scarborough schools are on free and reduced lunch program. So keep in mind that these are households that don't have the same opportunities to have daycare opportunities for their students on their remote learning days. These are households that may not be able to take time off from work to be able to be home with kids on their remote learning. So you know, you also need to look at this as a student welfare issue and as an equity issue and try and get these school, these children back to school full time so that, you know, these families can have the, the burden that is remote learning removed from their lives. So thank you so much. 
Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in attendance who would like to make a public comment this evening? Mr. Perry. Oh, hi, good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you. Great, thank you. Originally, I wasn't going to speak. Um, I guess let me back up. First of all, I have a three-year-old son um, and a six-year-old son who is currently in a part of a homeschool pod. Um, we live over in the Pleasant Hill area. So my older boy would be attending Pleasant Hill, um, hopefully five days a week um, in the fall. So originally I wasn't going to speak, um, but something happened to me this, this morning, actually, ironically, that I would like to share. So at around 1130, um, I was at a stoplight and I saw a gentleman out there and I had a brief discussion with him. He was a um, a panhandler in his forties. And, you know, reason why I had a conversation with him, a brief one, he was standing there with his six-year-old son. Um, so being the father of a six-year-old, I kind of took that hard. Um, he was out of work. He was homeless. Um, they said they were bouncing around from house to house, um, you know, staying where they could. And um, I asked him if his boy was in school um, and he said, no. I didn't really get a chance to go beyond that. Um, but as I did drive off, I <laughs> played over about a hundred scenarios in my head um, as to what, you know, what led them to that situation. Um, regardless of any of those scenarios, the one that stuck with me was that really could have been any parent, any parent in Scarborough um, who has been forced out of work, forced to stay home with their kid, um, their child, while their schools closed or in hybrid. Um, and let's be honest, hybrid um, is not the same as open. So uh, while I know and appreciate all the work that's being done by everybody, um, hybrid for us is is not working anymore. I don't, I don't feel. So on a positive note, um, in looking at kind of the meeting agenda and um, some of the material that, that went around earlier, I am grateful um, to see progress being made with the review of the Biddeford plan um, with the engagement of Harriman Associates to do some spatial analysis. Um, so that I, I will say kudos for that. Um, upon review of these plans and these assessments that are being done, it's absolutely critical that the board be transparent on the steps, the timing and the costs needed to get our children back to the five days a week, um, or at least the option this year of going back five days a week. Um, you know, again, transparency on the result of these findings and reviews is going to be key. Um, it'll help ease a lot of the, the stress um, on, on parents, teachers, on everybody involved. Um, we have the funds existing and forthcoming. We have the resources. Um, and, and most of all, we have the community to to get behind our kids and our teachers who, as far as I can understand, are contractually obligated to perform in a safe environment. Um, so again, we, you know, we're asking for a transparent plan for the families to establish um, the steps or execute on the steps um, to, to make that plan happen. Um, I'll leave it at that and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment this evening? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. Going to do a little housekeeping here just for a sec. Agenda item 6.0 this evening is the FY22 um, public hearing on the school proposed budget. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Sandy and Kate. Hi there, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm having trouble pushing buttons myself this evening. Um, I think Sarah was actually gonna start this off for us a little bit and then let me 
dive into the more detailed bits. Is that what you're thinking, Sarah? Yeah, sure. I'll just cover off um, the first slide, if you don't mind moving it forward. <laughs> Cool, thank you. Yeah, so Kate's going to cover the detail. I just wanted to take the opportunity just to kind of set the scene as to where we were, uh, or sorry, where we are rather. And this is an image that hopefully um, those of you who are watching have seen before. It's been, it was created by by the town, but it's been shared in a bunch of different communications. So we want to continue to share it. Um, and, and really the, the point of putting this up there at the start is just to try and demonstrate that we're really just at the beginning of this process. Uh, it was just last night that the town had their first reading. Uh, and so what you're going to see tonight is some details behind what our first reading was. Um, and the town's first reading was a little bit different um, in, in that they actually made a, a past in motion and an amendment to sort of reduce the budgets for where they came in originally. Um, uh, to the tune of about 3.4 ish million dollars. So what you're going to see tonight does not reflect any work that's been done following the, the motion that was made last night. Um, but that isn't final and that really just kind of starts the process. So uh, what we hope that uh, folks who are out there watching and listening tonight will do is, is reach out to us, let us know what's important. Um, as we go through this budget process, what we want to make sure remains in um, and, and what's of value to you and, and your families. So with that, I will hand it over to Kate. Um, and I think we have this image again at, at the end to, to put up, um, to sear into your minds when when you can stay engaged. Screenshots. Um, yeah, yeah we, should, we should note that these um, presentations are posted on our website after each meeting. And um, there's a ton of budget material on um, the town and school budget portal. And there's also an appendix slide at the end of this presentation. We didn't wanna get too deep into um, tons of detail, but there is tons of detail out there for anyone who's interested in following along with the budget process and um, getting more information. And um, I will just make a pitch right here as your school business manager that None of the things that we want to do in this school district can be done without enough funding. So bear that in mind and, and support us as we move along. Kelly, could I have the next slide? Thank you. So real quickly, um, these are the um, guiding thoughts that we brought into our budget development process this year. Um, very different from the norm. Um, we built a budget just before the pandemic hit last year, and this year we had the benefit of living through uh, the months of pandemic school, and, and we had a little bit different focus in our budget. Um, and we wanted to take a look at what had happened in this prior year as we started to think about moving forward and hopefully moving out of the pandemic environment. Um, so what we're looking at was to make sure that we could maintain our current programs and services um, and stay healthy in school. Um, big underline on that one. And also talk about coming back into school after having been in the hybrid mode and what kind of needs our students would have that might be different um, in this new environment. Next slide, Cal. This is a snapshot of the school operating budgets. Um, it doesn't include the capital budget. Again, there are, are documents posted online which can give you every last little detail of what's out there in our proposal. But what this shows you is the budget that was approved by the school board at first reading on the 15th of March. And as Sarah mentioned, um, we've gone to the next step where the town council has approved the municipal budget in first reading and what they have authorized is not what we have put on the table, but that's where the process comes in. We need to work together to figure out how we get to the right end point. And um, if you have memorized that slide that Sarah cautioned you to do, um, you would have seen that we have a, a finance committee meeting coming up on the 28th, which will be our next opportunity 
for the school and the town to work together towards the next steps. So this shows you the fund, general fund operating budget, which is our K-12 budget. That's what you folks vote on. Um, we have our adult education operating budget and our school nutrition budget. An overall increase um, on expenditures of just under 2.5 million or 5.28%. And um, then we show the non-tax revenues, that's school subsidy for the most part and a few other small revenue sources. And the net amount is what we are asking for in taxes from the citizens of Scarborough. The tax request for the school department is not the increase to the tax rate. It's simply a portion of the formula that's used to derive the increase in the tax rate. Next, Cal. So again, our focus as we were building the budget, um, our leadership team pulled together and did their usual budget process, which is very intensive and takes several months. But again, the focus has been really um, heavily on what is it going to look like in the coming fiscal year, which starts July 1st and takes us through the next school year, what, what is our life going to be like um, recovering from COVID, the COVID impacts? Um, and you saw some of the things that I mentioned in the earlier slide. And the other piece that's been um, really difficult for us is to figure out what kind of enrollment we're going to have next year and how to address the appropriate levels of class size. Um, and of course, the CDC guidance is a big piece of that, the social distancing requirements, and you'll hear an awful lot more about that in the next chunk of this evening. Next slide. What we call level services is basically doing the same things this year and then doing them again next year with the understanding that children uh, change their grades, that programs come and go, uh, but essentially level services is maintaining what we currently have. About 80% of our operating budget is in personnel costs, staff, salaries, and benefits, and the uh, increase in our budget this year, about 74% of the total overall increase in our operating budget is made up of these costs. So um, bearing in mind that we're a people organization and that we really spend very little money on um, stuff, other things. Um, and if you are going to be a budget geek with me and get into reading the budget book, you'll see all kinds of cool pie charts in there that tell you where your budget dollars go, where your tax dollars go. Next slide. This chart gives you a quick one-shot view of the changes from FY21, fiscal year 21 is where we are today. Um, fiscal year 22 is the budget that we're building. And so this tells you um, what's new, what's different, what's gone. Um, the budget from in FY22 retains some of the folks that we added um, with COVID in mind. We added two school nurses and that need remains. Um, we now have one nurse, um, a registered nurse in each of our school buildings, two in the larger buildings. Um, critical need, they've been uh, working tirelessly to keep us safe this year. Uh, one special education teacher that we added is gonna be retained and it, uh, we didn't add 23 bus driver positions. That's our full complement of bus drivers. And we want to retain our full complement of bus drivers, even though our community has been driving their kids all year long and allowing us to distance on buses. Um, we're going to need all of those positions when we get back to filling our buses. The budget removes some of the funding that was specifically allocated for COVID preparations because we've prepared and we're there. Um, it restores some positions that were lost uh, in the FY21 budget. About $1.8 million was reduced out of our current year budget, causing us to lose a number of positions that we are hoping to restore 
um, we behaved in emergency mode in the spring of 2020 when we were trying to build the budget for this year. And we acknowledged that we were in uh, a difficult time and we didn't know what the future would hold. So we, it, we eliminated a number of positions and now we are hoping to restore those knowing that we are heading back into um, what may be a little bit more normal year and also knowing what the loss of those positions has cost us in this current year. This budget also adds a half-time social worker. We have a half-time position that we'd like to make full-time. Um, that is, uh, I hope, an obvious choice in a situation where our kids' social emotional needs are so high. That would be at the high school. Um, it also adds two special education ed techs based on a new rule coming down from the State Department of Education that extends the amount of time that teenagers can be in high school. Um, it extends the age limit. And so we will have students in school longer in special education programs. Five classroom teachers are included in this current budget proposal. It was um, passed by the board. However, since that time, we've received word that we will be getting funding from the federal government. And um, this is sort of too in the weeds for me to explain all the different grants that we've had. I'm throwing you back to the budget book, it's all in there. Um, however, we do know that we have sufficient funding um, with this last round to go back to the uh, round before that and use that money to pay for the five classroom teachers. So. Uh, it's our proposal that those will be removed from our operating budget, but the positions will be able to be funded with federal funds. Next slide, Cal. When we put a budget out for first reading, there are always items in motion. And uh, items in motion means that we don't know all of the details of our outside costs, costs that are influenced by outside factors, um, typically until we get further into the budget process. So this is a list of the various things that we take a look at between first and second reading. Um, I'll call your attention to the nice red words that say that the Anthem health insurance, um, the increased value that we budgeted is about $350,000. And with the funding coming in, the premiums coming in flat, um, that's a savings, which is awesome. Unfortunately, we are going to need that savings to pay for the debt service estimate, which was too low. So that kind of washes things out. Um, but we do have another, a number of other moving pieces that we're keeping an eye on. And our hope is to be able to um, reduce our ask for um, our budget proposal that went in first reading. So that in second reading, we can have a smaller number but also uh, meet the needs of our, our students. Next slide, Cal. There are a number of items in our capital budget. And again, I didn't represent that here on a slide, but there are two items that we're particularly watching the cost on and we'll be having more conversations around. Um, as you may have heard, the school department has taken on the turf and track turf field and track renovation project that was proposed by the town some years ago. And um, we have added that into our budget this year and plan to be the supporters and promoters of that project. Um, and we are working on budget estimates that will help us refine that number a little bit. Um, and the second item here bulleted here is our long range planning project. And um, with that, we've got a placeholder number in our budget and we are um, leaning on our building steering committee to help us figure out if that's the right number and to uh, define what that amount of money will purchase for us. I think we can do the next one. Oh, look, it's the budget calendar. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this slide. I think the, the next one, which Kelly can scoot by, um, it has a link to the budget portal and it has a bunch of sort of fine print around all of the words I've been speaking to you. 
Um, but do take note of that calendar. Please memorize it, print it out, and put it on your fridge and um, share it with your friends because your support along the way here is really going to be critical to us being able to retain what is in this budget proposal, which will then allow us to spend the federal funds that we may have available on getting our kids back to school with the restrictions that we're facing. Um, do you want to have some question time on this, April, or? Uh, absolutely. If there's anybody on the board who would like to ask Kate a question, I know we've seen this material a bunch of times, uh, you know, but for the public, I just feel like it, you know, we have a great audience. We have a ton of people who are engaged in our meetings. And so we wanted to take another opportunity to just go through the budget high, you know, from a high level. Um, and to speak to Kate's points, you know, being at this point, your advocacy as constituents is so needed um, at town council finance committee meetings, at our own finance committee meetings, at full board meetings, at town council meetings, email the town council, not just the school board, um, to advocate for our investments. You know, they're going to be they're going to be looking to hear what people are going to be willing to support at referendum, just like they do every year. Um, and so we really need to provide that strong voice for um, our kids so that we can get a nice, um, you know, budget that will will serve their needs in the fall, because we know that the needs are going to be great. Does anybody have any questions for Kate? Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Kate and Sarah, for pulling that together for us today. You're welcome. Thank you. you. Agenda item uh, 7.0 is superintendent report. And tonight, Mr. Prince will be presenting the fall reopening update. Thank you, April. Indeed, we're here tonight to talk about the opening of school. And that's been our goal to return full time in person in the fall. Next slide, please. We have some assumptions that hopefully these assumptions um, are correct that the three foot distancing will continue to be in place for students in September. Um, we will come back to school full time, full time, but we need to be proactive with safety nets to support us if pand pandemic conditions change, such as if we need to temporarily go yellow or red because of an outbreak. As you know, DOE is developing a roadmap, roadmap, roadmap to the recovery plan, and that will be coming out Hopefully soon, we've been waiting for that. And uh, I did call DOE and, and they explained to me that that should be coming pretty soon. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing what they have to say that will match our plan and, and we can learn from that plan. Next uh, slide, please. So <clears throat> this year, you know, we've had our facilities director Todd Jepson um, work with a local commercial broker for a listing of commercial office spaces. Because again, part of thinking ahead, we were a little worried that we may have to get some other spaces because we just don't have enough space in the building to bring everybody back. So he's been working with a commercial broker just to kind of keep us abreast of possibilities out there in the community. Um, we entered into a conversation with the university. We are very t have close ties with the University of Southern Maine. Both the um, professor, Dr. Flynn Ross, and the dean came over to, uh, uh, we're on Zoom with them, talking about the potential of having interns within the district. And, and th there's a possibility for that. There's some limitations on that. And I'll just give you a quick example. Um, when you take an intern, the new model now is to try to have that intern end up with 
part of a classroom. And as the intern gets more experience, potentially maybe they could take on a couple more students. The disadvantage that they really would like to have the intern be in their own classroom. And so, you know, that's a little bit of a limitation for us here in Scarborough. But again, we want to continue to have those conversations because we think it's an opportunity if we need to go that route. Todd has been in touch with our architect firm uh, to really look at maximizing current space utilization. And he'll be talking about that tonight. And then we are forming reopening planning committees, uh, going to be school-based, and to really look at the logistics, the challenges, and the opportunities for each school as we begin to open school in the fall. And that those committees will be meeting starting fairly soon in May, and uh, we have good representation, hopefully, from the commun community on that as well. The site, as I was just talking about the um, school-based teams, again, I first of all, I want to just congratulate the start committee last summer for the work that they did. It was really a representation to come together and represent all the schools and departments. And now we're just feeling that, again, uh, we could be more localized at each building and for each building to have teachers, a school nurse, parents, students, school board member, support staff, and administrator come together and really begin to talk about the fall and to kind of get into the nitty gritty of what that's going to look like. Next slide. So we are committed. Uh, we're really trying to do some good planning. I'm very optimistic. And I do appreciate people's patience. I know this has been a long haul, particularly for the parents. And uh, I put a letter out today to the staff just explaining to them that I hope they have a wonderful vacation. I know it's been a hard year and that I mentioned to them that we'd be presenting this work tonight. And I'm hoping we have some staff members that are watching. Next slide. So Todd Jepson is going to jump in and kind of walk through the next two or three slides. Uh, he's the expert when it comes to classroom space. Todd, are you out there? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you. Yes, as Sandy said, we've been uh, working really hard to analyze all of our spaces. And uh, as you all know, uh, the whole spacing uh, demands from the DOE have been a bit of a moving target. We started out with six foot distancing and uh, last month it was changed uh, to three feet of distancing. So as we were working our classroom spacing, we uh, then had to go back and change it all to three and keep it six feet from the teachers and bear in mind that students needed to be six feet apart to eat. Um, so uh, it, it wasn't just a simple draw a box and stick in the chairs and desks and students. It was a little bit more complicated and so we are in the process of adjusting. The other challenge in our district is that at every school there are varying room sizes and in every phase level there are different materials and supplies and equipment uh, in the classrooms that take up space and, and uh, so we've done a lot of weeding and uh, condensing and storing. Uh, if you've driven by any of the schools, especially the high school, you'll see all these large storage containers and so forth. So um, the challenge has been to try to uh, get as many students as possible in a classroom with those varying sizes. For example, at the elementary schools, the primary schools, uh, they, they actually have three different size classrooms because the buildings that were built originally in the 50s and 60s, then the renovated sections in the 90s, and now the portables that are added onto all of them as well. They're all different sizes. Um, so anyway, our work with Harriman, uh, they have been our long range facilities planning firm for quite a few years. They actually built and designed the renovated high school uh, as well as Wentworth. So we had a lot of uh, things in place already in terms of size. So it began uh, with them several weeks ago and we are uh, 
finalizing those drawings and maximum student uh, occupant loads for the classrooms. And it's, uh, it's looking really positive in terms of how many kids we can get in. There will definitely be some compromise for, for the way the rooms are laid out. Um, it's gonna feel rather uniform, I'm afraid, but that's something that we're willing to work with. Um, the other challenges we've had is that you know, the enrollment has been a bit of a uh, moving target. So we're trying to keep our eye on the most realistic numbers of the students that will be returning. Um, at a school like the high school, course offerings also uh, impact uh, how many kids are in what types of courses because the kids can sign up for their classes, unlike in other lower level schools. Um, staffing has been a huge challenge. Uh, in order to get back uh, with the numbers we can fit in classroom is going to require more, more teaching uh, staff to uh, be in those classrooms. Transportation uh, also is a challenge. And probably the resounding refrain we heard from all the principals this week when we met with them to show them uh, what we uh, have come up with so far is feeding the students and a place to do that in the way that the DOE and CDC recommend with the six foot distancing. It's really challenging at the K2 schools and the middle school to do that. Um, and if you were walking through, you would see desks and tables in very strange places to accommodate the feeding of the students that has to take place. Um, and again, the overall overarching goal we try to keep in mind is to follow the guidelines and keep all of the occupants safe. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, in this process, as Sandy referenced, we have considered many alternative space uh, considerations are in the town, everything from uh, churches to, as Sandy referenced, commercial office spaces. Um, the first challenge was to see, if, you know, I, I always look at how much space we have and say, can't we, can't we make what we have work? So we started out by storing everything out, outside of classrooms and making more room inside our buildings for these things to happen. I mentioned that earlier with all the storage containers and things stored in spaces that technically they shouldn't be stored in like boiler rooms and hallway corners and things. Um, and then we reconfigured some spaces within the buildings uh, to, or we changed purposes of rooms. For example, the Pleasant Hills um, staff and faculty room is now a special education uh, space with, with several employees who work in that department in there. And we've found an alternative space cordoned off in the Pleasant Hill cafeteria for the staff. So again, there's been a lot of compromise and goodwill uh, asked of the staff and they've all um, complied and done a great job. And it's, it's really been encouraging to see uh, the willingness and flexibility of the staff. Uh, last fall, we also set up tents uh, for just a mask break or an outdoor classroom setting or an eating area on nice days. Uh, we'll put those back up uh, right after the April break, uh, now that the ground is drying up and it's getting a little warmer out. Um, the pictures on the right on this slide are actually of what I consider to be the most promising community space. It's the, the Point uh, or East Point Community Church. It's in the old Bob's Discount Furniture Store near Clark's Pond Home Depot if you haven't been there. Uh, it's a beautiful space. We uh, had someone reach out to us from the, that place and they have uh, several spaces that could be used as classrooms. I visited there and we looked over the whole thing. They also have a, a gym and another uh, sort of an indoor turf uh, field. And it, it had some real potential. Uh, we also talked with uh, the Rock Church and St. Max's Church. Those were actually not going to be alternatives for us. Um, Scarborough Downs also offered a space in their uh, sort of on-track observation area. It's a big space. It's more of an auditorium style space. And uh, we're going to be challenged by the ongoing activities uh, in that building and to be combined with school operations. So... And then finally, as many of you know, our community services department uh, is operating their childcare facility out of the old House of Lights, which they've now called the hub. And we've talked with them about the potential of, you know, maybe a portion or some segments of that space being used as alternative classrooms or overflow classrooms if the need arises. Um, and then the town manager referenced that the Alger 
Hall. It's a Masonic, the old Masonic Lodge down by Dunstan Fire Station uh, is now owned by the town. And I looked at that and um, I can tell you with 100% certainty that will not work. Uh, it has some significant air quality issues um, that I wouldn't want staff or students exposed to. Um, but I still appreciate everyone reaching out and giving us some great ideas. Um, and back to the point, um, we, we put in a bunch of questions after our visit and uh, we are waiting to hear back from them about some of the questions that we have in terms of how to make something like that work. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, the commercial properties that we've looked at, I've connected with the Dunham Group and they have put out a listing from all of firms besides Dunham Group um, of the various commercial properties that are available. And uh, some of them are, uh, might be suitable, but might also be combined with other businesses, which may not want the sort of disruptive neighbor of a school or school classes there, but uh, ongoing conversations there and visits uh, planned. Uh, everything from professional office space to sort of industrial park kind of warehouse spaces that might be able to accommodate uh, or, or be you know, quickly renovated or, or you know, dusted off, shall we say, uh, to accommodate additional space if, if we need that come the fall. Uh, challenges there are, are they really easily convertible? Um, the things we think about aren't just desks and chairs. There are things like technology and safety and security and transportation and uh, meals, indoor air quality, uh, where do the nursing and health, health staff reside. That is all what I consider to be the infrastructure, sort of the intangible. Um, all the stuff I handle is tangible. Um, so, but I have to take all these things into consideration when, when deeming something worthy of classroom space. And the good news is I'm not the only one that has to decide that. So finally, the town manager uh, referred us to uh, the person who uh, has some space in the old Bessie school, which is across the road from the, the town hall and uh, also some space above the Scarborough grounds uh, business across the street. Um, I've got calls into that person as well and I'm waiting to hear back as well. And then finally, we actually even just drove up to this childcare facility which is on Route 114 between Eight Corners and uh, Payne Road. And unfortunately that space has been consumed by a physical therapy uh, business. So it's being converted. It's already been taken, unfortunately. So we are a little late to the trough there. So uh, the good news is from our studies with Harriman is it's looking like we can get more desks or uh, students in a classroom uh, so that uh, fall reopening is looking quite promising. Um, it will again involve some adjustments in terms of class sizes, which may impact staffing and hopefully we'll have the budget to do that. We're also challenged by the types of furnishings. Uh, the, the slide I first showed had desks in it. Most of our elementary schools have tables, um, but we're also finding that as we analyze how you set up the tables, that it's looking quite promising that we'll get uh, quite a few students in a classroom with the tables as well. Again, other precautions in place. Um, so um, I, I don't have a lot more to say other than I, I think we're looking really good to house our students on our own properties for the fall based on uh, the results of our Harriman study and that with some sort of creative programming and staffing, uh, I think we're heading in the right direction for a positive outcome for fall and our students in our own buildings full on five days a week, in my opinion. Thank Sandy, you, back to you. Appreciate it. I think we have one more slide. So this is just to pick up what Todd had talked about. Um, again, we're very optimistic for September that all students will be back in the Scarborough schools. The need will be to hire additional 12 teachers and we'll continue to look at the ESSER three funds that will assist with um, trying to make sure that we can hire at least 12 teachers. And uh, that's the real need here is now that we can get the number of desks or tables in the classrooms, now we need more staff. 
And over the summer, I think Todd will continue to repurpose uh, different spaces in the certain schools um, just to make sure that we're ready for September. So I'm 100% confident at this point in time that we will have all our students back in school for fall. And I think that is the last slide. Thank you so much, Sandy and Todd for presenting all of that information. Um, at this time, I will take board member questions and comments. Nick, you can go first. Let me unmute myself, there I am. Um, <clears throat> so what I have to say is, is more of a comment than a question. It's really addressed to the board, but also everybody in attendance. So um, first I wanna, I wanna thank you, Sandy, and all of our staff and community members who have contributed to this work. Uh, aimed at reopening our schools. Um, I also want to thank the people that have spoken in public comment recently and shared their passion and concerns regarding um, the status of our school and students. Tonight we heard several people talk about a desire for transparency and our success for the rest of this year and next fall really depends on that. Um, many families in our community have experienced multiple COVID-19 close contacts and or infections over the past 13 months and I can understand how that's frightening and, and frustrating and stressful and disruptive all at the same time. I wanna thank most of those families for being forthright and communicating with our schools so that we can take steps to keep your children and our staff safer. But in the interest of full transparency, I also wanna say that it's come to light that, that some may not have been completely transparent and communicative in the ways that I just outlined. So I'm asking please um, to everybody in attendance and share it with anybody you talk with and. Um, if your child tests positive or part of your family is asked to quarantine, please heed that advice and notify your child's school and those that are potentially impacted. Our collective success as we endeavor to return to more in-person learning this year and next fall depends on you. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Gabby and then Shannon. Um, first, I just want to say, like, thank you for all this work. It's making me really hopeful for my senior year, and it's just, it's exciting to hear about. Um, I actually have two questions. So my first one is, with, like, the separation of church and state rule, is it, like, allowed for public schools to teach in a church? I don't know if that's a rule. And then also, um, for the older, like, high school students who would be vaccinated in the fall, do you know if the three feet rule still applies to them? So the, your last question, Gabby, my understanding is there's a lot of movement with the Superintendents Association to have perhaps DOE, CDC to look at those guidelines, particularly for the cafeteria and um, other restrictions, because if, if we didn't have those restrictions, we would be much in a better place. So I think there's a lot of movement to have the governor and her, her her colleagues up there to really look at what we're asking. So I think more will come from that. Uh, I don't want to lead people to think it's going to happen, but there's a big movement to, to look at that. Um, and your other question was, remind me. Sorry about that. It was about the church and state and like yeah. public schools and churches. So that's a really good point. We would have to, I mean, if we get, at this point in time, we're not really going to move forward with any additional space. But if we had to, then I think we would have to pursue that with our school attorney and get some information on that. Good questions. Thanks, Gabby. Go ahead, Shannon. Um, I had a question about the study, and I'm not sure if Todd, perhaps you said this and I just missed it, but how many... Um, how many, I, I know the classrooms are different sizes, but how many students per class can we, can we fit in based on the new study? Uh, it's I'm sorry, let me get my, it's, it's really a range uh, of size of numbers. So I think we're up to 16 to 19 at the maximum, depending on the largest size classrooms. So, and that's with, again, realistic put them up against the wall, even if we're blocking a bookcase, get them in there and keep them six feet from the teacher and three feet apart and then allowing reasonably, uh, when I did this, I actually sat in a student chair and said, how much space is it gonna take for a child to 
slide back and get out of their desk if they have to go to the bathroom or something. So we gave a slight, slight, a few inches extra for them to go in and out and still remain three feet from the person behind them um, with the desk, uh, you know, separating them. So I think 16 to 19, depending on the school and the classroom they're in is what we've come up with now. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Um, KT. Is there one building that will have a greater staffing need than any other one, or is the 12 teachers pretty well spread out? Diane, do you? you yeah, so the, the 12 teachers really um, are nested more at the K-8 level than they are at the high school. Um, and again, that's just because, you know, high school operates very differently um, than any of our other phase levels do. So, you know, that is 12 teachers. That's above and beyond the budget proposal that um, Kate and Sandy shared at the beginning of the presentation tonight. Um, but again, I think that if we can target those latest ESSER funds towards that, um, that will certainly better position us to be able to fit that need. Thanks, guys. Um, I don't see any other hands, so I will go ahead and say my comment, which is um, Todd touched on this a little bit, and we we had someone touch on this in public comment. Um, one of our biggest challenges, my understanding, is the eating, is the giving, the making sure that the kids can unmask, because right now the guideline is still six feet. Um, are we anticipating that it will be three feet? for eating in the fall? Like, is that our assumption? Because that to me seems like it's still gonna be a really big challenge to fill our schools and, and all the desks and all the configurations are gonna be set up for three feet, but we still have to find a way for them to be able to eat six feet, correct? Yeah. Cafeteria is the biggest challenge for most districts. If I, if I might butt in here a little bit, uh... <clears throat> the the cafeterias also are the gymnasium uh, facility in the K2 schools. So under normal circumstances, it's challenging to serve lunch and then clean it all up. For those of you who are parents, and I'm a parent of two boys, um, kids make a mess when they eat and then squeeze the kids back in for phys ed. Um, under normal circumstances, that is nail-bitingly tight. And now with six foot distancing, kids eating in their classrooms and one custodian in the building, huge challenge there. So um, we can make it happen and we will. My staff has been amazing. If I could take a public moment to commend my custodial and maintenance staff for the work they have done under these circumstances, they have been astounding. Walk through any school and look at them, they're clean, and the custodians are showing up and the maintenance guys are shuffling furniture every which way and stuffing them every corner and container they can find. It, I, I can't say enough about my staff and I appreciate all of those who, who have acknowledged that to us because it, it goes a long way in keeping us going. So thank you. Thanks, Todd. And definitely on our behalf, let them know our hats are off. We, we couldn't do it without them and we know that. Um, Sarah and then Alicia. Thanks, April. Uh, Todd, at a prior meeting, I forget what it was now, and it was a lot while ago, we talked about there's like a, a desk and chair shortage in not just in, in Scarborough and Maine, but it sounds like in the country. Does does this plan does that impact our plans to be able to go back full time with the three feet distance with more, more desk and equipment than we have today? I'm going to answer that with the utmost confidence and say no. Okay. Um, we, uh, the biggest place we were challenged is uh, we moved a lot of tables out of the middle school. Um, we saved the ones that we could absolutely reuse. Some of them literally they were 26 years old or whatever, 25 years old the building is, and they fell apart when we moved them, so we had to throw them out. But I have successfully ordered over 400 more desks for the middle school and they will be here as I've been promised sometime in June. 
so they will be here for the fall. We'll have the middle school ready. And I think we're going to be able to make the tables work at the K-2s with the numbers that we are allowed to have in those spaces. And it could be, again, some creative programming on the teachers and principals of those schools part. But again, they've stepped up and done an amazing job in their tiny little schools. Um, so they're making it happen. So I, I'm, I'm pretty confident, Sarah, that we can, we can not worry about furniture. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Go ahead, Alicia. Thank you. I don't know what the um, plan format for the um, restart committees are, but hearing the public's um, comment um, tonight, that we heard a theme that they wanted transparency and, and to be kept updated. I was wondering if we could um, tape those meetings and then post them, if that's a possibility. I think we could look into that. I just don't know if the meetings were held at different times. And I think we could make sure we could get a camera set up. Um, I'm not sure how many cameras we have, to be honest with you, between the town and the schools. But certainly if we could do that, we will do it. Um, I think it's a great idea and it's great for people to, from the public to be able to watch those. They wouldn't be live necessarily. Um, I will take the opportunity to put in a plug for my fellow board members too. If you haven't let me know your availability and your interest to serve on one of those um, building committees, uh, shoot me an email and let me know if you can volunteer your time um, to, to do that. That would be great because it helps us keep the public informed too. The you know the more we know. Um, Leanne, um, just a couple of quick things. I want to confirm that it is the five that we've already requested plus twelve. So we're looking at seventeen teachers that we would need for this plan to work. Perfect. Yeah, um, and then I guess it's a plea really to the community. It kind of backs into what was said earlier. Um, please do support this with town council, let them know how important these 17 teachers are, um, how the budget really is gonna need to be able to support this in order for the doors to open and all the students to come back full time. It sounds like this is really the most critical piece of the plan is the staffing. Thanks. Thanks, Leanne. Um, I do see our attendees who have their hands raised. Um, unfortunately, during a board meeting um, at this point, I don't take public comment um, from anyone who's in attendance. But if you have a question or a comment, you can email us at boe at scarboroughschools.org and I will be happy to um, get you an answer to your question and, and address your comment there. Are there any other board members who would like to make a comment or ask a question? I'm not seeing any. So thank you again to Todd um, and to Sandy for the prep that went into um, giving the community an update tonight. I know that it was much anticipated um, and I'm sure we will get additional questions as the weeks go by. Um, and to address the, the transparency issue, you know, as frequently as, as we can give you an update. Um, you know, I, I had a request for this to be on every agenda from now until the end of school. Um, and I can't make that guarantee right now um, because we don't know what the update for May 6 would look like. Um, but by all means, you know, if we have something to share, we will share it. And also I wanna point out that board meetings are certainly not the only way that we share information. Um, there's a district newsletter that goes out weekly now, um, every Friday. And so, you know, that's a great source of um, information in terms of just getting that rolling update. Um, and so if you're not already reading that newsletter, or clicking on that newsletter, make sure you, you give it a whirl. With that, I will go ahead and move on to agenda item 8.0, which is new business. Tonight, agenda item 8.1 is the second reading of the 2021-2022 school calendar.
you want me to take it, April? I would love for you to tee this up, Alicia. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, just like to back up to the to the history of um, what's gone on with the with the school calendar, we do have a board policy ICA that um, talks about how the board um, school calendar should be approved, and um, that is supposed to be um, that administration presents the calendar to policy committee and the policy committee um, does the work at that level and then makes a recommendation to the full board. And um, I guess historically that hasn't been followed. And so we've, we've been trying to do that this year. We've got a little, I would say some, some growing pains, but, um, and, and probably it's partly because of you know, this is a tough year um, in general. So, um, the two real issues I think that we um, were faced with were the um, the request by administration for Wednesdays, um, whether it be um, for professional development of our staff, whether it be for uh, late start or early release, and the frequency by which that should occur. And then there were um, there was a question of um, the start days and. Um, how at the in particular at the lower levels how the administration felt that there needed to be um sort of a staggered approach to provide an um an opportunity for our students to you know see the school to get um used to that get used to their schedule their friends their um their bus ride perhaps um, and to get tested and to, to also allow the teachers some time to prepare. And so those are obviously um, things that are very important, um, but we've also heard that um, th our kids are struggling and need to, um, parents feel strongly that kids need to be back in school full time. And so um, the uh, request by administration was brought to us and um, the policy committee then met um, just as a group and um, Diane asked us to come up with five with some proposals we did come up with five proposals um, that was presented back to um, the building level principals to determine if there were any um, of those proposals that they could support because the consensus of the um, of the committee was that the um, staggered start of the school year was a little too slow, um, given the the concerns that we had heard heard from um, parents. Um, so we did agree on, um, or we had a consensus that it was not um, it was not unanimous um, <clears throat> to go with the the proposal five which is not what um, administration recommended initially. Again, that they recommended a, a slower, more staggered approach that would allow the kids to ease back into school. Um, and I guess if we can move to the next slide, I think that's where we'll see the, so this is the proposal um, from, from leadership. And, um, it would have us returning back to school um, on September 13 um, for, for K through five. Now, the, the issue for um, the older grades was not really, um, it, it, it was interesting because part of the discussion that we had was um, about how the transition should occur, which really isn't the school board's purview. Um, because you know we're not it's not our responsibility to try to run the schools but it became a discussion that we had to have because of the calendar and so we didn't have to do that at the higher grades um, and and so it was a little um, awkward and uncomfortable um, I would say to have um, uh, to have sort of a, a difference of opinion but um, I think that, Diane, maybe I'll pass it on to you to present the um, administration request initially, and then um, then I'll 
go back to sort of where we wound up, if that's okay? Sure, that's fine. So um, this was the proposal from the leadership team um, and our K-5 principals presented that at the policy meeting on Tuesday. And um, as Alicia has pointed out previously that um, the purpose of the time um, as presented is to build connections with students and families, to give folks a broad overview, to provide individual appointments, to get to know families um, and provide tours for the school, since many of our families will have never um, stepped foot inside um, their child's current school before since, you know, by the time we head back to school, we will not have um, had folks in, in side schools for 18 months. Um, and so you can see here, um, the original proposal has September 1st and 2nd as specific appointment times. Again, the, um, our teachers would be spending, you know, um, the entire day meeting with each of their families. Um, and then following the extended Labor Day weekend, which has been traditional on our calendar, um, the following week would be a half a day on the 7th and 8th for um, half of the classroom to again engage kids, get them used to um, the way things are organized and the protocols that will have to be followed and um, on the morning of the 9th and the 10th, all of the students would be together. And you can see that from the 7th through 10th on the proposal, um, students would be attending for half a day, and that would be to allow teachers an opportunity in the afternoon to have individual screening appointments with each of the students. I think everybody is well aware that um, there is definitely um, concern about learning loss or where our students are starting from. And so it is going to be really important for um, all of our staff to, to have solid information about the skills that students in their classes are coming with so that they can plan for instruction appropriately. If you can go to the next slide, Kelly. Um, the K-5 administrators um, at the meeting on Tuesday also provided a rationale for their request. Um, they had worked together with their school teams and staff around this proposal. Um, they felt strongly that, again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, actually two thirds of our families at the K-5 level will never have been inside um, their child's school before. Um, students won't have been in school full time. Um, and none of our students will have had a full year in, um, in their school uh, because of you know, this pandemic that we've had. And um, in order to provide a little bit more information, um, they also wanted to give some reasoning for why we have screening appointments for K-5 students. Um, and again, you can see those listed here, not just about making connections with students, um, but also meeting their families, getting important information about their students. The beginning of the year is always a time for teachers to connect with families and to get to know their kids. Um, but at this time, you know, th there may be more information um, in terms of you know, how children have fared during um, this hybrid learning time that parents feel is important to share. And we want to honor the time that it would take to have each of those conversations and also um, building relationships. And so that is in addition to, you know, some of the academic screening that would happen. The next slide. Um, actually, um, this goes on to talk about early release, so we can probably hold off on that for now so that we can have this part of the conversation. Does that make sense to you, Alicia? Sure. So, so the, 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 thank you, Diane, for doing that. So the proposal that um, the policy committee, committee came up with was um, that um, on September 1st, the 
grade six and nine would, would go into for an introduction to school, which I think is something that's been occurring. A five would be appointment by only, uh, be by appointment only. And then September 2nd would be um, grade six through 12 will be attending school. K five will be by appointment only. And again, that would allow for that, that screening um, to occur. Um, on September 3rd, we have no school. September 6th, we have no school, it's Labor Day. September 7th, again, students grades six through 12 will be attending. K-5 will be a half day. And on the next day, the 8th, um, six to 12 will be in school. K-5 will be a half day, morning only on both of those days. And then on 9-10, all, all um, students will return back to school. And, and this was not unanimous in the committee level. It was something that, um, was um, proposed to administration that they said that they could live with. It was something that I think as a group we said that we could live with and it was to try to find a, a middle ground um, to meet the needs of the kids after hearing administration's, you know, really strong um, feeling about the need for that, that testing and that preparation and that this is gonna be really difficult and overwhelming to the kids um, along with, um, hearing very strongly from our community that they feel that kids need to be back in school. And I don't know if you want to ask questions about the start of the day, um, start of the year, or um, if, and if so, we could, we could do that now and then move on to the Wednesday discussion more fully. My recommendation would be that we discuss this portion first. And then we discuss the the early release portion next, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah, um, that's fine. Great. Right. Kristen has her hand up. Yeah, yeah. Can you just explain to me the difference between what's happening on the first and second versus the afternoons of the seventh and eighth? Like what the different screenings are? Did you say Alicia? Anyone. Maybe Diane could answer that. <laughs> yeah, um, the um, first and the second would be um, for um, appointments with families. And so again, those would be um, the meetings that I described where parents could talk about, you know, it's kind of like a parent-teacher conference, right? At the beginning of the school year, but again, because of, um, the experience, the most recent experiences that folks have had and students have had in terms of, um, you know, our hybrid environment, folks thought that that was important. And so it would be relationship building, um, finding out more about students and giving parents that chance to experience the school. And then the screening appointments, which would happen on the half days on the following week, would be dedicated to getting that academic information. So, um, you know, I can totally appreciate uh, without recapping the entire policy meeting that we've come to a compromise here or that was the suggestion, um, but I would just make sure that, that people understand that it will not be possible for a teacher to screen every student in their class in two half days um, and so, you know, we will have to make a plan for um, how to set those up and when um, other students can be screened, whether that be hiring substitutes or um, having other people cover what, you know, but, but that will be a creative problem solving that we will have to engage in. Okay. Thank you. Nick and then Sarah. So I just want to add, I, I think I got my head around exactly what's being proposed here, but given what, what Diane just said, it kind of sparked something for me. So if those two half days for K-5 aren't enough to get that screening done, what, why wouldn't we do that as two full days to be able to get that done? I'm just wondering. Diane, do you want to, I, I think it's a, um, I think you're a little confused, Nick, and may okay. and definitely Diane, correct me if I'm wrong. Nick, I think the that half day time, the two half days, yep. 
all kids will have gone home and the parents bring their child back for a screening appointment. And what Diane is saying is that those two half days are not enough time to do those screening appointments. So we're, that's why the administration had asked for four half days. So, okay, so the, 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 the AM only is actually AM instruction and the afternoon is the screening. Yes. I think okay. the idea behind it was to help kids transition back to school. I think our administrators, again, I don't want to speak for them, but I guess I am because I'm on the meeting, um, uh, that our administrators wanted to, you know, respond to parents' desire to, you know, make sure that we're getting kids back in soon enough, but also being really thoughtful about the transition. Like, our, our this is just a different start and so wanting to be thoughtful around that time but you know certainly if you know the board wants to consider just providing that in one fell swoop and not having that staggered approach um, you know again I think that administration is open to whatever folks can support to make sure that our students have a thoughtful return okay Sarah, go ahead. So, sorry if I'm, if I'm not understanding. I thought where Nick was going with his question was the same question that I had, which was, I guess, couldn't we use the, the, the full 9-1 and 9-2, which is by appointment only, to do some of those screenings? We can certainly look at how to structure the time that we have. Again, you know, this was the proposal that was was brought forward by the team. Um, and again, if this is the time that they have, they can go back and figure out what is the best way to structure that. You can see where the conversation gets muddy because that type of discussion is really uncomfortable for, was really uncomfortable for me as a board member to have because, you know, that's not really within our our responsibilities and so it's just the calendar and so you know but in order to make the calendar work we need to consider you know well how many days of screening do you need and um and how to structure that and so it it's it's a tough conversation yeah and i and i think if i if i if you don't mind april like just to, to piggyback on what you were saying which i think i heard you say diane that you know, we may not be able to do all the screenings or it's going to be a challenge to do all the screenings in the half days, which is why the, the proposal was for the full days. Um, but, and maybe it's my ignorance, right? I'm just not fully understanding why we couldn't use the 9-1 and the 9-2 days to do some of that screening as, as well, which is why I asked the question. Um, so. Idea originally was that if we think about kids coming in never having met someone before and like, hey, hello, nice to meet you, sit down, let me give you this reading assessment. Um, and so in the planning, our administrators were really thinking about that relationship building first um, so that you know they weren't just reading kids cold. But again, I think that whatever time that we are given, um, we will look to maximize for our students. Kristen? Yeah, I had more of just a comment about going back to school. Um, and I know that in years past, the PTA has been really helpful getting kids to meet some of their new classmates and acclimated to school. And we've had a ton of offers from the community to pitch in where they can. So maybe there's some more opportunities there between the parents some of the more seasoned parents who know the school and the PTA and getting some people back to the buildings. Does anyone else want to make a comment on this portion of the calendar? So I, I'll make I'll make my comment then. Um, 
as Alicia said, the recommendation came out of the policy committee. Um, it's our job at the committee level, all of us, no matter what committee we're on, is to try and build consensus. Um, you know, Alicia pointed out I there was a dissenting voice, and that was me. <laughs> um, and that's not to say that I can't or won't support uh, the committee's recommendation, um, but just to kind of, you know, explain to the board why um, I felt the way I did is just, you know, I think that we're getting a little bogged down. I, I personally feel like we're getting a little bogged down with this idea that the kids aren't um, actually back in school or that the start date isn't until the 13th or, you know, these sound bites kind of, you know, roll around. Um, but the, the kids are there. They're there every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday um, in different iterations of, of being there. And they're not, and I, and that's actually, I'm misspeaking because they're not there both Tuesday and Wednesday. That was split by alphabet. Um, and, you know, those screening appointments, again, for me, I just feel like it's so important to get these kids off to a great start and everybody wants, we all want the best possible outcome for our kids. Every single person who works so hard. Um, and it might just be a difference of opinion that I think those screening appointments and having the kids be all over the map this year those screening appointments are probably going to take longer than they have typically taken. The teachers are going to, you know, maybe need that that extra time to the for the kids to, you know, get used to being assessed and all of those all of those things. And I just think there's a lot of unknowns. The admin asked for four half days. The compromise was two half days, um, and that's that's, you know, kind of where we landed. Um, and so that's. That's why I wasn't 100% on board with the recommendation um, of the policy committee. Max. Um, I just wanted to agree with you about just like phasing back into school. I mean, like, I agree the teachers are probably going to have a lot of um, newer issues surrounding just kids being prepared. And like, like a lot of people have commented, there's been um, some lost time this year. Also, the whole thing about, like, students have not really had a full normal day of school in, like, 18 months. So going back five days a week is definitely going to be very difficult. It's probably going to take, a, a, like, a real physical toll on them for, for the most part. So I would just support, like, going back in as slow as possible. Not as slow as possible, but, like, as comfortably as possible. Thanks, Max. So uh, if there are no other comments on this portion, um, the other part of the calendar that we need to approve and vote on tonight um, is related to uh, the proposal that came from our leadership about um, early release versus late start and the frequency of those days. And I will kick it back over to you, Alicia, if you wanna talk about the policy committee's recommendation. Um, actually, Diane, do you want to um, start with the leadership's proposal for early release? Sure. Um, so, um, and again, the, I also have the data from the surveys um, that will be in the next couple of slides as well. So, you know, I, I can present both of those. Um, so the proposal from the leadership team in regards to um, early release time was um, to again have some focused time during this transition back to school to full in-person learning. Um, we certainly know that there are going to continue to be some challenges as we bridge back over to um, a more normal five day a week schedule for all of our students and families. Um, we also wanted to make sure that um, people recognize that there is time necessary for improvement efforts. Um, this actually came up last night in our DEI committee where um, we're working on developing an action plan for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We had a great um, uh, discussion with some of our high school students who had, had actually gone down to K2 um, to deliver some professional development 
to our teachers yesterday afternoon. And some of the things that they recognized was um, that there is a lot of room for growth and a lot of things that our, our teachers may not have had for professional development um, because of you know, their, their tenure with us or um, the fact that the district hasn't really dug into this kind of training in the past. And so there's a, there's a lot of work ahead and it was noted um, you know, by at least one individual in the meeting last night that um, when is this work going to happen? And so again, um, we need time with folks in front of us to move these things forward. And so um, we had listed for the policy committee when we had met, um, not just Tuesday, this actually comes back to our original proposal, that um, some, of the big some of the big things on the plate right now for the district besides um, the DEI work also includes um, the social emotional learning um, and the plan. We've had a social emotional team that's been working for the past two years um, in terms of looking at curriculum for all of our students and really making sure that we're attending to those needs. And so they're getting ready to launch off that work. Um, our grade level teams, um, certainly at some levels more than others, really struggle to find time for teachers to meet. If you go to one of our smaller schools, for example, um, the first grade teachers don't have common planning time. And so there isn't the ability to just pull people together while kids are at specials and provide them with that training because everybody's schedule is so unique. Um, and we also you know, have heard about the need for us to review our curriculum and update our curriculum. Um, and you know, as an example on this slide, our science and social studies curriculum um, have not been reviewed for a number of years. Um, and then another example is the shift in state testing. Um, the state has moved away from the Empower Me, the traditional MEA test, um, and they're asking all districts to start using NWEA. Um, and that's great for the 50% of the districts in the state that had been using that. Um, we have not been using NWEA, and so that's another professional development piece for our teachers because it's not just giving the assessment, but it's how do you use those assessments? How do you make sure that it's not just a check mark that we tested our kids, but you're actually looking at the results to help you plan for instruction? So, so these are just some of the things, and again, I know that time is at a premium, um, and we certainly recognize that. We want to have our kids in school. We also have to figure out how to make sure that we provide the skills and development that our teachers need to be the most effective. If you go to the next slide, um, uh, this slide is the parent survey data. So um, in late March, when um, this was still under development, we had surveyed staff and parents because as some of you know, traditionally in the past several years, the district has done a late start. And this year during the pandemic, we have had an early release. And um, so we wanted to get a sense from our community about where their preferences lied. And so um, this is the parent data. So if you take a look at it, you can see that 57% uh, of our families preferred the afternoon versus the morning. Um, and then the second question, um, the pie chart that is below, um, asked about um, what plan for professional development could folks support? And so the choices were a weekly late start or early release, a bi-weekly late start or early release, or maintaining the traditional once a month early release that we have had. And again, that would be a 90 minute early release or late start. And as you can see here, 67% um, of our parents wanted to maintain um, 
the current once a month um, schedule. If we move to the next slide, you can see how that compares to staff. Um, staff felt a little bit more strongly than parents about um, having uh, early release, but again, there was agreement there that staff felt like early release was more productive um, than late start. Um, and the second question in regards to which of those three models for professional development would staff support? 43% um, of the staff uh, said they could support weekly. 34% um, said once a month and 22% said once a week. So, you know, those are just, again, other points of information. Um, I know that you had asked as a board to have us provide that for you in terms of the feedback from parents and from our staff. And so we wanted to make sure that you have that. Thank you, Diane. So um, I think we were unanimous in our uh, recommendation about Wednesdays, and that was um, that it should be once monthly early release. Um, and one of the um, prime considerations in coming to that recommendation was the fact that community services indicated that they're not able to support um, our students on, on Wednesdays for early release on a regular basis. And so, um, you know, that, that was a concern uh, for us. It's interesting because if we're gonna make a move like this, it, it, the argument and the discussion was that, you know, maybe this is the time to do it um, because people have shown that they're able to do it. And then on the other hand, maybe it's like, you know, the worst time. So, um, but, for me personally, the fact that community services uh, was not available was a really strong consideration. I, I also thought it was interesting that um, staff wasn't overwhelmingly advocating for weekly professional development. So I, I, it's hard as a, as a sort of a lay person to understand um, why some of those things happen. And so to hear all of the work that needs to happen, um, and then and and know that you know our staff are so devoted and dedicated, um, and to see that you know only about forty something percent um, supported weekly professional development was just sort of curious to me. So those are our um, recommendations, and I think we could open up to questions for the the Wednesdays if if that's okay with you, April. Sounds great. Shannon, you're first. Thanks, April. Um, I just have more of a um, uh, of a comment to the Wednesday schedule. Um, I, I definitely, I, I don't think um, my vote or my say is, I, I don't want it to sound like I don't support continuing education or supporting our teachers and increasing their 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 needs you know they learn new technology there's a lot that they do in professional development that i completely agree with and i i completely am on board with my problem is as soon as we know that community services community services cannot support this i, I it's almost a non-starter I, I don't know how we can ask our parents to um to to find an avenue or to find a way to to watch their kids, especially when we know we, we have childcare that's already at a premium. So um, I, I don't, uh, to me, this is, I, I would agree with the, the once a month, but what I would also suggest to Diane and to um, leadership team is maybe you look at this um, with an eye toward planning for the next school year. So perhaps we start earlier on with all of the stakeholders at the table. So transportation for buses and community services and um, everybody that has a stake in this and get together and see what what's going to work and what can be supported and what what is just not going to work and how do you overcome those things that aren't going to work. So I think it's something that um, potentially in the next the next school year that you could work toward. But right now, um, it, this just isn't it, as much as yes, I, I agree that maybe this is the time. It's really it's not the time. It's not the time with with the challenges that they're that we're facing. 
Thanks, Shannon. Um, I think a lot of what you said about, you know, scaffolding this for, you know, future school years was pretty much, you know, where the conversation landed um, with the policy committee as well. Um, Nick and then Leanne. I'm unmuted. Okay, there we go. Um, I just wanted to to um, to thank the policy committee for bringing this back and for making this notable change. Um, as probably people recall, and if you don't recall, you can go watch back and watch the video. I was um, I was pretty vocal and concerned about amplifying the number of early release or late starts next year, given the um, premium that in class instruction has and all the work we're doing to go back to school full time. And so. You know, there are many ways to engage in professional development. As an educator myself, I mean, I've found many ways to engage in it um, that aren't exclusive of students in the classroom when I was a teacher. So I just think that what we've learned this year and what we're looking forward to in the fall is more in-person instruction time. And I'm just so glad to see us return to this more um, modest use of the um, early dismissals, and I just want to thank you for bringing this forward, and I support it completely. Thanks, Nick. Go ahead, Leanne. Um, I know I've been pretty quiet about all of this tonight. Alicia, thank you so much for um, really giving such a thorough representation of what went through with the very many policy meetings that we had to discuss this. Um, this was probably one of the hardest conversations I think we've ever had in committee. Um, I feel better about having a compromise in here, um, but I really just wanted to thank you for your leadership in getting us to this point tonight. So thank you for that. Thanks, Leanne. Are there any other comments or questions about the 21-22 proposed school calendar? Okay, and so with that, I will accept a motion to approve the policy committee's proposal for the FY, um, not FY, that's fiscal year, for the school year 2021-2022 school calendar. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any additional questions or concerns. So Diane, could you please call the vote? Sure. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Pazalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? No. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? No. Ms. Giftis? Yes. Great. Thanks guys, the motion passes. Uh, agenda item 8.2 is a second reading of policy JLCB, which is the immunization of students. So I will pass it back over to you, Alicia. Thank you, just a reminder um, that this will bring us in compliance with state law. We did amend the language to indicate that this um, policy will become uh, the policy changes will become effective September 1st of uh, 2021. And the reason why we're passing it now is so that the, the nurses can get their work done to notify their families and um, work with them um, to make sure that those immunization changes can, can happen. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve policy JLCB as presented? So moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, Diane, you can go ahead and call the vote, please. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Pazalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item 8.3 and 8.4 are the meeting minutes of March 4th, 2021, as well as the meeting minutes from March 18th, 2021. I would like a motion to approve both as presented, please. So moved. 
Second. Is there any discussion? Thank you, Kelly, for preparing those for us. Um, Diane, I think you can call the vote. Mrs. Gibbs? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cavalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Gibbs? Yes. And sorry that my dog was also trying to vote at the same time. No worries. Agenda item 8.5 is appointments. Agenda item 8.5.1 is the appointments of our Scarborough High School spring coaches. Um, Kelly sent us this material ahead of time, so you should have that in your packet. Um, do I have a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Diane, you can call the vote, please. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cavalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sither? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Right, thank you and congratulations to our coaches and thank you for your time because we know that that's a tough gig. Agenda item 9.0 is adjournment this evening. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. <laughs> Question. I have none other than I hope that everyone has a safe and healthy spring vacation and we look forward to seeing you all when we return. All right, Mrs. Giftis. Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cazalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sither? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Wow. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.